In late summer 1943, famed war correspondent Ernie Pyle sat above a newly constructed port in Sicily, the island near Italy's toe that Anglo-American forces had invaded in early July, taking in the scene below. Pyle had sailed there with Allied troops across the Mediterranean from North Africa. Before D-Day in Normandy 11 months later, the Sicily campaign, Operation Husky, was the largest seaborne invasion in history, involving an astonishing armada of nearly 3,000 ships. Pyle wrote, quote, There's no way of conveying the enormous size of that fleet. On the horizon, it resembled a distant city. It covered half the skyline. Even to be part of it was frightening. Those ships delivered 180,000 soldiers ashore, but also 14,000 vehicles, 600 tanks, and 1,800 large guns, and half of this huge quantity during the attack's first 48 hours. Many landing craft carried not people, but supplies. 20 carried water alone, and in subsequent days, other supplies would follow. Food, fuel, ammunition, spare parts, medicine, maps, cigarettes, tents, radios and telephones, and much, much more. Everything that a modern army needed, and modern armies needed a lot. We kept pouring men and machines into Sicily, Pyle observed, as though it were a giant hopper. American abundance of natural resources and the ability to mobilize and focus them gave the Allied soldiers, sailors, and airmen a tremendous advantage. Watching the mountain of supplies on Sicily's shores grow higher and higher, an idea dawned on Pyle. Quote, Suddenly I realized what all this was. It was America's long-awaited power of production, finally rolling into the far places where it had to go. That power of production helped win the war. Historians Robert Coakley and Richard Layton have written, quote, to a large degree, the improvement in the military situation in 1943 was a result of the huge outpouring of munitions from American factories and of ships from American yards. World War II was a war of thousands of guns, tanks, and planes, a, quote, gross national product war, according to one historian. It was a total war, a mobilization of nearly all human and natural resources. That meant it was also a war that shaped and was shaped by nature. Two weeks into the campaign, President Franklin Roosevelt observed, quote, when we send an expedition to Sicily, where does it begin? Well, it begins in two places, practically. It begins on the farms of this country and in the mines of this country. Wars can be understood in many ways, strategically, politically, economically, socially, personally, but also environmentally. In World War II, geography and weather shaped battles, and battles remade landscapes, often dramatically. The war also remade landscapes far from battlefields through extraction, transport, processing, and pollution, but also through new technologies, organizational strategies, and ideas. The conservationist Fairfield Osborne wrote in 1948, quote, obviously the areas where war is actually being fought are violently injured. Yet the injury is not local, but leaves its mark even in continents far removed from the conflict because of the compelling demand that war creates for forest and agricultural products. These are in truth poured into the furnace of war. Fueling the furnace of war in the mid-1940s reconfigured American relations with the natural world in long-lasting ways. To begin with, Great changes flowed from the nation's vastly expanded productive capacity, which grew by 50% from 1940 to 1945, as well as from the extraction of materials from farms and mines needed to fuel it. New tools invented or vastly transformed and popularized by the war also reshaped American relations with nature. Atomic weapons, synthetics like plastic and nylon, New metal alloys such as aluminum, drugs like penicillin, DDT, 
insecticides and herbicides, bulldozers, what Pyle called the magic instruments of war, airplane technology, including jet engines, sonar, assembly line house construction, and the first computers. In 1944, David Lilienthal gushed about, quote, new machines of wizardry that spun out, quote, the stuff of a way of life new to this world. Combined with vastly expanded production, these new technologies dirtied the nation's air and water in new ways and on a new scale. Because of skies darkened by smoke, steel towns like Pittsburgh had to turn on the lights during the day. Smog smothered Los Angeles. Michigan's Willow Run, Seattle's Boeing Plant 2, and hundreds of other military industrial sites spewed the noxious pollutants that would eventually make many of them into Superfund sites. In 1941, Hooker Chemical, a defense contractor, began dumping the toxic substances into Love Canal that would decades later seep into the basements of unsuspecting families, causing a national scandal. Wartime imperatives also created a new military-industrial geography of extraction sites, chemical munitions and aviation factories, and hundreds of military bases linked by rail and new road, shipping, and air systems. Speed took on new urgency. So too did cheap, plentiful energy. Electricity generated by New Deal dams powered new wartime industrial corridors in the Pacific Northwest and Tennessee Valley. Cheap oil and its infrastructure remade the Gulf Coast. In the search for new energy, physicists blazed new trails in America's subatomic landscape. In the process, the war engineered a military material culture that would shape daily life for decades. To the extent that we live in northern cities or the Sun Belt, work at defense industries or companies that support them, eat processed food from fertilizer-fed fields, and cover up leftovers in saran wrap, smoke cigarettes, subsidized for soldiers, travel by airplane, wear and use petroleum-based clothes and products, use aluminum and a host of alloys, and rely upon antibiotics when we get sick. We are today following patterns of life pioneered and popularized during World War II. New ideas also sprang up. Depression-era restraint gave way to no-limits optimism. Keynesian ideas of a consumption-driven growth economy took root. Guns and butter seemed newly possible. A can-do techno-optimism, the motto of the Seabees, suggested that no natural hurdle was too high for American know-how. A counter-response also sprouted. Deep skepticism of technology emerged even before Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Ecological views of environmental degradation and resource limits took hold. Awareness of pollution grew. The global conflagration transformed the thinking of Aldo Leopold, William Vogt, Rachel Carson, David Brower, and other architects of the post-war environmental movement. In sum, the war forged the world we live in, not just the political and economic order, but also the built environment, material culture, and intellectual topography, not to mention American landscapes near and far. The need to supply Allied troops to create the, quote, might of material that Ernie Pyle observed arriving in Sicily spurred many of these changes. Thank you.